Okay. But yeah, Dr. Cowan will take will. This is this. Well, good morning again. If we could everyone take their seats. We'd like to welcome you into the plenary session this morning. Just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, we had just had a, a great uh, early bird presentation on the Zika uh, virus and some of the international uh, responses. Uh, we will have another early bird session tomorrow. So uh, we had coffee out here at 6.30 and um, had a great crowd. So please keep that in mind for tomorrow. Um, one, one unfortunate note for today, we, um, uh, Dep Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work has unfortunately, uh, schedule got changed, so he will not be presenting this morning. However, we will, uh, we will move on. So and right now, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Dr. Cowan to the podium, who will introduce our speakers for today. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference as much as I have. The, the amount of energy and, and uh, fellowship and relationship building that I've seen in the hallways as well as in the lecture halls and the breakout rooms has been outstanding. And uh, this morning is another special morning. We have uh, Dr. Jennifer Lee from the Veterans Administration. Her, her boss, Dr. Shulkin, was scheduled to be here and passed on uh, through Dr. Lee, his regrets for not being here, but like, doc, uh, like Mr. Work, uh, there is a transition going on, and uh, that's where their priorities had to lie this morning. So uh, Dr. Shulkin has sent his uh, deputy, Dr. Jennifer Lee, who is the Deputy Undersecretary for Health and Policy and Services at the Veterans Health Administration. Um, She's held this, uh, she provides guidance on matters related to healthcare policy, strategic objectives, and policy requirements for all of the legislative mandated uh, healthcare delivery programs. She received her medical degree from Washington University Medical School, so we are fellow alumni. I, I graduated there. I was probably in an earlier class. <laughs> and she completed uh, her residency in emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins board certified in emergency medicine. Can we have a warm welcome for Dr. Jennifer Lee, please? Great. Good morning. Uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, as uh, Dr. Cowan said, uh, my boss, Dr. Shulkin, our VA Undersecretary for Health, really wanted to be here uh, to deliver these remarks to you, uh, but our transition team arrived yesterday, and this morning is the very first briefing and overview of the health administration, so um, he is there. If there was any other conflict, he would have been here, um, but really regrets that he wasn't able to come. The other message he wanted me to share, too, um, was that he uh, wanted me to express our support at VA for AMSIS and for forums like AMSIS, where we can come together as federal practitioners and providers and have a space to learn from each other, to share best practices, to develop new partnerships and relationships to solve problems together. And we look forward to continuing our support and engagement with AMSIS going forward. Uh, what uh, Dr. Cowan mentioned that uh, I serve now as uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Health for policy and services at VA. Uh, I came into this role about eight months ago, um, having, um, I was actually at VA in uh, 2011. I started there as a White House fellow uh, under Secretary Shinseki and moved into the Health Administration. 
uh, then left to serve as Deputy Secretary of Health in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I was really pleased to come back to VA because I, I believe that VA has the best mission and the best patients in the entire world. And I feel that way after having served for a time at, at VA in the central office, but also after having cared for veterans in the ER. Um, I worked um, at Walter Reed as a contractor uh, while I was on faculty at George Washington. And I see patients now in the ER and uh, love seeing veteran patients and love taking care of them and serving them through finding new ways to improve our system at, at VA. And I know Dr. Shulkin and our entire leadership team and everybody at VA feels that same passion and commitment to serving veterans. Uh, and Dr. Shulkin himself actually sees veteran patients at the New York VA. So I came back to this incredible uh, place at VA with this wonderful mission, but we've had a lot of challenges in the last few years. And uh, we're, uh, when I came back, I found a uh, agency, a, a, a VA that was in the middle of a striking and massive transformation. Uh, and everybody is committed to transforming VA in order to meet the challenges that we face in access and otherwise. So Secretary McDonald uh, launched the My VA initiative with a goal to make VA the number one customer service organization in government, to make VA a place that veterans, employees, and taxpayers can trust and are proud to call My VA. And this initiative um, has done a number of things at VA, which I think have been really profound and have been, and are resulting in, in uh, the kinds of changes that we need to become a system that can serve all of our veterans in the best way possible. Some of those changes I just wanted to talk about uh, include um, organizational and leadership changes, cultural changes, and also process changes. From a cultural standpoint, uh, we, again, truly, we have uh, the best mission and values at, at VA, I believe. Uh, we embody them in what we call our I care values, which are, stand for integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. And it's what everybody at VA uh, takes on as our uh, a mantra in serving veterans. But what we found is that although the values are, are sound and our mission is noble, uh, sometimes in the day to day, it's hard to translate that uh, into the consistently right behavior in every single situation because VA, like many uh, federal agencies, are, uh, is a, a little risk adverse. And uh, we've developed too much into a rules-based culture rather than a principle-based one. And so the My VA initiative really sought to change that culture so that whenever there was a decision point or a way to help veterans to uh, a, a decision of how to help veterans the best way that we wouldn't be hampered by our own internal rules or policies, we would every single time do the right thing for the veteran. And even if it means that we have to change some of our internal policies, but that we would take that, make that harder decision to do the right thing for veterans. And this principles-based approach is really working in VA, and it's helping us to keep the veteran at the center of every single thing that we do and every decision that we make. Uh, in terms of the leadership team, uh, there was a deliberate uh, in, intent to build in, again, the veteran voice, and also to build in voices of outside partners into our work. So the My VA Advisory Committee was established with uh, leaders and representatives from the private sector and, uh, and uh, industry to help us uh, think about how we can best serve veterans, provide the best customer experience ever to our veteran population. But we also have a veterans experience office where the, the leaders in that office think, come to work every day and think about how can we make every veterans interaction with VA pleasant and easy and enjoyable and satisfying. So these things have been, um, have really created uh, great change at, in the entire agency at VA. From the health administration standpoint, what my VA has meant for us is a singular focus on our biggest challenge, and that is access. So all of us committed to the my VA access declaration. 
which simply put is that we will commit to provide same day services to any veteran who has urgent needs in primary or mental health care. So a veteran with a need for care will get it right away that same day, whether it's in person, telehealth, via uh, phone or some other virtual care uh, approach, but they will get the help that they need that day that they need it if it's for an urgent need. And we committed specifically to ensuring that each of our VA medical centers could provide these same day services in primary mental health care by the end of this calendar year. And we are on track to meet our goal. We have now uh, way over 100 sites and to getting closer to our goal by the end of this year of same day services for veterans in primary mental health care. And this has been our singular focus for this, these last, this last year, this last two years. The reason why, to me, uh, that this is so important and that we have to ensure that we are meeting the urgent health needs of veterans is because of the tragedy of veteran suicide. Suicide prevention is our priority and it is so unacceptable that we have 20 veterans a day dying by suicide. In 2014, there were over 41,000 adult suicides across the nation. 18% of them were veterans. And that's, that's how we get to the number 20 per day. Each day in our leadership team, uh, we review the issue briefs that come up about specific veterans who have taken their life by suicide. We pour over those details and ask ourselves, what could we have done differently? How could we have prevented this? Are our policies right? Are, is our access good? Is there anything that we could have done to prevent this? Each and every one of those lives is so heartbreak that taken by suicide, so heartbreaking for us. And we know, I know that suicide is not just a veteran problem, a veteran issue. It is a public health issue across the nation. It is a military issue. It is a national issue. Um, in two, since 2001 to 2014, Across the nation, it's been an increase in suicides of about 20, over 20 percent. But if you look at the, vet, the veteran rate of suicide, that's increased over 30 percent. And if you adjust for age and gender, the risk for suicide among veterans is 20 percent higher than the general population. This is why we're focused on access every single day. One of the things that we uh, did this year that um, I'm proud of and I know that you will hear about later today uh, in a longer session on suicide um, is we, we put out the most comprehensive report on veteran suicide ever completed in the US. This was a partnership between a collaboration between us at VA, DOD, and CDC. And you'll hear about this later today, but just to give you some highlights from it. Um, in, the report uh, represents data culled from over 55 million records, over 50 states and territories uh, from all the way up through 2014. The last time we put out a veteran suicide report uh, was in 2010, and that was data that was collected from states, which amounted to really representing only about 3 million uh, in, in terms of the population. This helps us to understand the problem so that we can attack the problem. Some of the things that we found in our report uh, are that most of the veteran suicides are among older veterans, those age 50 or older. Most veteran suicides uh, involve a firearm. We also found something that was encouraging to us, uh, if there is anything encouraging in these numbers, and that's that um, although the rate of veteran suicide has increased in general, it's increased at a slower rate from th among those veterans who are using VA services, who are in our care. And you can see the difference uh, for those not using VA services that increased over 30%, but those using VA services uh, only about 9%. And the breakdown for male veterans, a little bit closer, not using VA services increased by 30%, uh, using VA services by about 11%. Interestingly, the difference was really, was more striking among female veterans. Oh, okay. There we go. 
of those veterans, uh, female veterans, uh, not using VA services, the rate of su suicide increased uh, by over 98% compared to those using VA services by about 5%. And we find other disturbing trends too uh, among women veterans, that the risk of suicide among women veterans is 2.4 times higher than the risk of suicide among female adults in general. The fact that uh, VA care um, does help prevent suicide uh, is, is not that surprising to us because we know that the quality of the care that we provide, especially in mental health care, is at least as good as in other systems, but many times actually better. The problem is that of the 20 veterans who die each day by suicide, only six of the 20 are in our care. So the 14 of the 20, if you will, are the veterans who are unknown to us. So what do we do about this? Earlier this year, we had a suicide prevention summit. We brought uh, uh, people together from uh, other, from DOD, from other federal agencies, from the private sector, uh, from Congress, uh, to talk together about this problem and to commit to, think, to steps that we can take to help prevent veteran suicide. As I said, only six out of the 20 per day are known to VA. So one of the things we want to do is to uh, increase awareness among veterans that they have, there are services available to them at VA to, to help them, in, especially with mental health care. And we need partnerships to help raise awareness of these types of services. We also launched a uh, broad media awareness campaign uh, to, to help get the word out to veterans about the services that we have in VA and that it is okay to seek help. We have a PSA actually that I'd, I'd like to show at this point that, that was part of our uh, campaign to raise awareness. But I have a story and I don't know where to start. I'm good, but I feel alone in a crowd. I'm good, but nobody understands. I'm good past keeps coming back, but I can't get out of bed. But I can't sleep. I'm good, but I feel overwhelmed. I'm good, but I don't feel safe. But I don't even know who I am anymore. But I still have nightmares, but I don't need any help. I'm good, but I don't feel anything anymore. I'm good, but I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. So are you ready to listen? We've really been pleased with uh, the reaction from, um, from industry, from uh, foundations, from nonprofits, from advocacy groups who uh, want to work with us um, on the, the issue of veteran suicide. And we are committed to partnering together with anyone who is willing to tackle this problem. We're also committed to exploring innovative solutions uh, to tackling suicide. One of the things that we're doing involves big data and predictive analytics. We rolled out a program this month that we call ReachVet. ReachVet stands for Recovery Engagement and Coordination for Health, and Veterans Enhanced Treatment. Uh, what, it, what it is is a program that's based on analytics of, of, of analysis done on data in our own electronic health record among veterans that are known to us in the system. We found that uh, there are a series of factors that we believe may predict the risk for suicide uh, among uh, a subpopulation of the veterans that we know. Uh, specifically, we think that the highest risk population, the top 0.1%, may have over a 30 times higher risk of suicide um, if, we can, if these factors are present. So what we did with uh, this algorithm uh, that was developed jointly be with, between VA and uh, NIH, NIMH in particular, uh, is to roll this out in uh, pilot stage first, providing the names of veterans who, again, are already known to us in our system to their own care providers and asking them to reach out and uh, ensure that that veteran 
is aware of services that might be available to them uh, to check in and uh, make sure that they're aware that their, their care team at VA is thinking about them and acknowledges that they, that they are there if they need help. The crisis line is uh, another major strategy that we are using in suicide prevention. Of course, we in the last uh, year have doubled the response. In fact, we've uh, increased by over double the number of respond responders in our veterans crisis line and opened a second call center in addition to the primary one in Canandaigua. We have one opening in Atlanta uh, and operating now. Uh, what we've also uh, been careful to do is ensure that there uh, are backup uh, call centers in place, the same call centers that uh, would be accessed through the SAMHSA lifeline if our responders are unable to, to get to the call. So there's always uh, a, res a live responder answering that call and ensuring that uh, any veteran in crisis gets the help that they need. What we found with, in doing this is interesting. Over the last year, we've seen that the number of referrals to suicide prevention coordinators in our system ha has risen dramatically. So uh, when we get a call into the crisis line, uh, if when that patient, every single patient gets connected to a care team uh, and gets a warm handoff and immediately connected to them, the suicide prevention coordinator that's closest to them uh, follows up uh, and makes sure that they're, they're, they're in care, they get ongoing care. This is the number of referrals uh, to suicide prevention coordinators over the last year. If the veteran is in immediate crisis, then uh, an emergency responder is dispatched to them. And this is a, a trend in the last year of a number of emergency dispatches to veterans. So, to us, this shows that uh, we are, uh, we have tremendous need. We knew that from the numbers, um, but the work that we're doing is helping to address this problem, and we need to do more. It's not surprising when you, th when you look at the rate of increase of um, utilization of mental health services in VA. So this is growth since 2005 in mental health services uh, used by veterans. The lower uh, line, if you can see that, is just use of VA services in general, but mental health services is much higher, as you can see, much, much more dramatic increase. This is part of our challenge in access, because here this shows the top line is the increase in demand for mental health care, and the lines below show the staffing that we are, um, the staffing increase for mental health services, both outpatient and inpatient. Uh, we just haven't been able to keep up with that, that increased uh, demand over time. But there, we're, we're exploring every possible way to do that. And one of the ways we're uh, leveraging and moving out aggressively uh, with is through telehealth. Last year, over 12% of veteran patients uh, used telehealth services in VA, VA in some form or another. That's over 677,000 veterans. And that translates to over 2 million encounters in telehealth in this last year. That's more than any other system is doing in telehealth. And we offer telehealth in a number of specialties and a number of uh, modalities, whether it's home telehealth, uh, video, uh, or store and forward. And what we find is really good patient satisfaction with our telehealth services especially telemental health. In fact, some of the uh, feedback we're getting is that the telemental, some veterans uh, prefer the telemental health to in-person mental health encounters. We also are seeing a reduction in hospital admissions uh, and uh, avoidable visits through our telehealth program. So we're moving out aggressively to, to expand telehealth even more, especially because it helps those veterans who are in rural areas to access VA services. Of the 677,000, almost half were veterans in rural areas. We're using mobile apps as well. The Veteran Appointment Request app, the VAR, or VAR for short, that we're rolling out enables a veteran to uh, schedule an appointment directly, a primary or mental health care appointment directly with their provider or care team. We also have a number of free mobile apps available um, that help veterans to deal with PTSD, uh, depression, to do self-coaching and care 
uh, through uh, their mobile device. And there are many more innovations that we're rolling out to improve the quality and coordination of care uh, through uh, mobile health. We also have hired a lot of new providers in VA. So as a reference point, VA employs over 24,500 physicians and over 93,000 nurses. We are, uh, our footprint is over 1,200 healthcare facilities, which includes 168 major facilities and smaller, over 1,000 smaller outpatient clinics. In this last year, we've increased our net staffing by more than 20,000 employees. That includes more than 6,600 nurses and over 1,600 physicians, including many psychiatrists and also 450 psychologists. So we are um, uh, working aggressively to meet the demand, uh, especially in, in mental health care and, and focusing on the urgent needs first. We're also increasing the utilization of care in the community. This just shows uh, the general trend of the uh, increased use of care in the community by veterans. Uh, you'll see it's approximately an increase of 20% in the last year. The green bars represent care that was uh, delivered through the CHOICE program. So that's increasing dramatically and enabling access for veterans in the community. I think we also need to look at innovative workforce solutions. Um, I heard that um, uh, Congressman Heck yesterday mentioned our intermediate care technician program. And uh, it's something that we're really proud of and uh, working to expand. This was actually a, uh, a program that uh, I started working on as a White House fellow with uh, an a interagency team with Karen Malabranch and with our nursing office um, in 2011. And we rolled this out as a pilot program. Um, and what it was was, uh, actually the way it started is uh, Secretary Shinseki asked us to see how we could employ former combat medics as uh, nurses uh, in the VA. And so we convened this team, we worked with unions, we worked with DOD, and uh, what we came to was a decision to create a new position in the VA that was modeled after uh, a, a position that the, the combat uh, medic or corpsman position uh, in, in the DOD. And we rolled it out in the ERs first, in VA, in 15 different ERs. Uh, the results were really positive. Uh, we got, um, oh, and I should add too, that there was no specific license or credential that was required for these positions. This was really based on uh, putting to work uh, those medics and corpsmen who we knew had the skills and competencies, the experience to, to work in these environments already and just needed a, a chance at a career and a chance and, and who desired a chance to serve other veterans, which was, um, we had overwhelming uh, interest and uh, demand for. So um, we were, we're happy to roll this out as a pilot. Since then, uh, we're continuing to push forward with the ICT program. I'm glad to um, be back in VA and to um, be working to, to expand this even farther in our facilities because it provides us with uh, a great pipeline uh, to, to build the workforce in VA um, uh, from those veterans who want to continue to serve and who have the experience and the skills to be able to do so. Actually, as um, I'll just mention too, one of the things I'm uh, really proud of uh, is in, during my tenure in Virginia uh, is that we uh, just this, earlier this year passed legislation to uh, create a similar program in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that is rolling out now the Military Medic and Corpsman Program uh, which aims to hire over 150 medics and corpsmen into uh, private sector uh, health and uh, hospital settings, uh, putting, again, the great, the great medics, the skills of medics and corpsmen to work uh, where we have workforce shortages and needs. So are all of our efforts uh, doing anything? Are we making any progress? We, uh, we believe we are. And that's based on uh, data that we see in our, our own quality metrics that we track. Uh, one called uh, the SAIL measure, uh, which is a composite score that we use in VA that includes a number of um, uh, industry standard uh, quality measures and then also includes uh, uh, additional measures such as recruitment and retention rates, employee satisfaction, veteran satisfaction. 
uh, and others. And what we found is that in the past year, over 80% of VA medical centers have made significant improvement in these composite quality scores. And you'll see uh, in the top uh, row, two rows, those that have made the number of VA facilities that have made both small and uh, large improvements. And we think that a lot of this is due of, uh, to our leadership uh, in our medical centers. We've gotten uh, uh, many, many new leaders uh, in our facilities all throughout the system. And we're pushing out again with the singular focus on meeting the access needs of veterans and first and foremost, the urgent access needs. In those sites where we, did, we knew we had challenges, we are also encouraged to see some improvement based on what we think is the most important measure, and that's what the veteran thinks. So uh, this shows a few of the sites where we've had challenges in the past, and, and we're seeing improvements based on the veteran experience of whether their routine and their urgent care needs were met. We're, we want to be uh, uh, very transparent about all of our data, and so there's actually now a map uh, that anybody can go to that's on the internet, and you can put in a VA facility and actually see the scores, uh, what veterans say in satisfaction surveys about whether the facility was able to meet their routine or urgent healthcare needs. And again, we're encouraged to see that when we ask veterans that the metrics that indicate uh, they are, um, that they, they see VA improving uh, in, in, ter in terms of service are increasing. So uh, here this shows, the, did veterans say that they got the care uh, or the service they needed, that that's increasing, the, the percent of veterans saying that they did is increasing, that veterans, more veterans believe it was easy to get what they needed that more veterans felt like they were a valued customer, and that more veterans, and this is really important to us, that more veterans trust VA to fulfill our country's commitment to serving veterans. So we do believe that uh, through all of the work of um, the MyVA initiative and our collective focus on this, that culture change and improvement is happening at VA, that veterans are feeling the difference, that they're getting more of the care that they need when they need it, that, they're, uh, that employees are uh, uh, feeling supported uh, in their roles so that they can carry out the noble mission that we have at VA, um, and that overall that, that it's a different VA because of all of the work over the last two years. At the same time, we know that we can't do this alone. Uh, one of our strategic initiatives has been uh, to focus on partnerships. And uh, this is a slide that just gives you a sense of some of the, the industry partnerships that we've uh, 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 created over the last uh, few years, um, and there we're working on even more. And we know that, uh, and we know that we can't do this alone. Uh, as a, a public agency, we, we want to continue to work uh, with our federal partners, especially DOD and HHS, to do even more in service to our veterans. Um, and, and that is why these forums and uh, these opportunities are so important to us, and we're, we're so happy to be here. I want to end uh, with an example of, of a great product of a partnership that we launched with Google. Uh, and there's a little video that I wanted to show, uh, if they can, if that's available. On the 6th of November, I would have been 26 years in the Army. I was a captain. I was responsible for upwards of 150 soldiers. My current level of injury is T4, so I am paralyzed from my chest down. I served in World War II and the Korean War, and I've been at this extended care facility for three years last September 28th. And you know, I've never been in a Veterans Day parade. I was never able to take a Veterans Day off. Rent got to be paid, bills got to be paid. It was something I'd always wanted to do, be in a Veterans Day parade, be in my parade. Today's Veterans Day, and we're going to use virtual reality to bring the parade to VA hospitals all around the country.
I've been at Google for a year and a half, and I'm also a veteran, served in the uh, Army for 25 years. So it's personal to me, you know, this means a lot. So what you're going to do is, you, when you put these on, is you're going to be transported to the parade in New York City. And, and at the parade, we got 360 degrees cameras on several floats. So while you're on the float, you guys can move around, look up, look down. There's a virtual merch right here if you want to join. Sure. <laughs> okay. There you go. And just hold it up to your eyes. Yep, I'm down there. I was moving in that parade. It was just great seeing all these people moving there around me. Most exciting part about a parade, since this was my very first one, was the enthusiasm from the public. It was a great show. And it was great that we were a part of it. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. That was, that was not only wonderful clarification about the mission and the direction of the VA, but I have to tell you, and I've, I felt it in the room, I think you touched the heart of everybody here because that personalized our commitment to our veterans and showed the, the vision to use technologies and, uh, and, and to do an ever better job. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Uh, now, I have the great privilege to introduce uh, Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy. He's the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, he was uh, confirmed by the Senate on December 15th of 2014. He's a bachelor's degree from Harvard, MD and MBA from Yale, uh, residency at Brigham and Women's and Harvard Medical School, where he's been on the faculty as uh, a professor and, and instructor. Uh, Dr. Murthy is clearly a dedicated patient-oriented clinician uh, he, re he has stated publicly that he regards caring for patients as the greatest privilege of his life. But he's also one of those rare guys who, who, from the very beginning of his career, has also understood that that doesn't happen in a vacuum. We don't just fall off a turnip truck and care for patients. The systems have to be in place. He, st he started his, his uh, initiatives in organizational medicine as a, uh, in, in college. Uh, he created an organization called Visions Worldwide, which is an HIV education uh, uh, pr for, for poor rural folks, um, both in the U.S. and India. He's, he started a number of organizations, and the latest of those being Doctors for America, which is an organization dedicated to comprehensive health reform. So uh, Dr. Murthy sees the system, and he uh, you know, he sees the forest and the trees, and, and sometimes that's a rare thing. So, Dr. Murthy, uh, the podium is all yours, sir.
Well, thank you so much, Admiral Cowan, for that kind introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here, and it is a real pleasure to be with so many members of our sister services and leaders and members of the Veterans Administration. Uh, you know, together you all help protect the health and security of our country, uh, and I'm deeply grateful uh, for all that uh, you do and all that uh, our services do together. So it's a real privilege uh, to be here. And I was uh, actually just reflecting when Admiral Cowan was uh, introducing me that um, you know, about a little, I was reflecting a little bit on my journey here, uh, not here to AMSIS, but here to medicine. And I, I had a very different conception of what medicine would be uh, when I was first inspired to go into the profession. Uh, and I was inspired actually by my mother and my father uh, who had a medical clinic in Miami, Florida, which is where I grew up. Now it was just the two of them building this clinic uh, building relationships with patients one by one, providing care not just to the individual, but also getting to know their family and their community. Uh, and I distinctly remember uh, this one, uh, one night in particular when I was uh, woken uh, suddenly by my mother. Uh, it must have been maybe two in the morning. Uh, and I was in elementary school at the time. And she rushed me and my sister into the car where my father was at the wheel. And there in the dead of night, we drove to a trailer park in Miami. And on the way, she explained to me that one of their patients, Gordon, had just died after a long battle with prostate cancer. And the reason we were driving to the trailer park is because that is where Gordon lived with his wife, Ruth. And they were worried that Ruth would be grieving alone. And even though this wasn't in their job description uh, as clinicians and as caregivers, they understood implicitly uh, that caring for people is about more than a transaction of services. It's about building a relationship based on trust. It's about getting to know them and meeting them where they are. It's about going that extra mile uh, to make sure that they are cared for and that they are well. And I will always remember the silhouetted image of my mother in her traditional Indian sari climbing up the steps of uh, Ruth's trailer and the door opening and seeing both of them bathed in moonlight, embracing uh, both with tears in their eyes. That's what inspired me to go into medicine, was the possibility of building those kind of relationships, of contributing to improving people's health in that way. But there are certain things I never imagined uh, way back then. I never imagined, for example, uh, that many of my patients would be getting much of their medical information from the internet. I never imagined uh, that apps would in many cases replace doctors and nurses uh, in the minds of uh, many people out there, particularly younger folks who are used to using apps. I never imagined uh, that minute clinics that you might find in a pharmacy or in a retail store might become the new doctor's office uh, for many people in our country. And what I also didn't imagine, uh, especially going into internal medicine as I did, was that I would spend so much of my time caring for patients who were suffering from substance use disorder. I happened to think that much of my time would be spent managing diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, dealing with cellulitis and other infections. But what I realized when I got to medicine was that substance use disorders were far more prevalent than anyone had ever told us. And we didn't often feel equipped to screen for, diagnose, and treat uh, substance use disorders appropriately. And that's what I wanted to focus on a little bit today. You know, when I left my hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital up in Boston, uh, to take the position of Surgeon General, uh, I, I did so with, uh, with humility, recognizing this was an extraordinary honor to be able to serve the public health of our nation. Uh, but I stopped also at my hospital one last time to say goodbye to everyone. And I will never forget the conversation I had with the nurses uh, who had supported me and who had helped train me ever since my earliest days in internship. And they said to me, they said, Vivek, if you can do just one thing during your time as Surgeon General, please do something about the drug crisis in America because it is tearing our communities apart. And they were right. I saw clearly in my own experience how substance use disorders not only were impacting individuals, but were hurting their families. 
And I saw how we could spend all the time in the world titrating somebody's blood pressure medications and getting the exact right dose of insulin for them, all to realize that if they had severe and untreated mental illness or substance use disorders, that the likelihood that they could follow through with our recommendations and go to follow-up appointments was severely diminished. And as Surgeon General, I've actually seen this problem up close as well from a different vantage point. You know, I've had the great privilege of traveling to many parts of our country and hearing firsthand from people about what is on their mind, about what concerns them. And I've had the privilege along the way to also meet with many members uh, of our uniformed services as well as uh, veterans throughout the country. And what I've heard in every community I've gone to is about the toll that addiction is taking. I've certainly in big cities uh, heard this everywhere I've gone. But even a few months ago, I was in a small remote fishing village in Alaska, Napastia, a village which is actually only accessible by boat. There's no road to get there. And even there, in a remote village of less than 500 people, they told me that the small, small room, if you will, uh, where they provided basic care uh, to people in the village had been broken into multiple times by people looking to steal prescription pain medications. That's how far the opioid epidemic has reached in our country. And opioids has been the aspect of addiction that has been perhaps most discussed and covered in the media over the last couple of years. And for good reason, because it is a problem that has grown very quickly. We have nearly two million people who are addicted to uh, prescription opioids in America. We now know that the prescription opioid epidemic is contributing to the rise of uh, heroin use and to the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. And since 1999, we've seen a quadrupling uh, in the number of overdose deaths from opioids that have paralleled a quadrupling in the quantity of opioids we prescribe. And to any clinician who's gone into the profession wanting to relieve suffering and improve health, this is a sobering and very disturbing statistic. And that's one of the reasons why a few months ago uh, I, I launched from my office uh, with our team our Turn the Tide Rx campaign which is a national campaign directed at clinicians, uh, a, urging them and encouraging them to join a national movement we were building to take on the opioid crisis by sharpening our prescribing practices, by connecting patients to treatment, and by also helping to shape how our country thinks about and talks about addiction, recognizing that for far too long there's been too much stigma attached uh, to substance use disorders. Now, I want to tell you that a little bit about what I learned uh, through this campaign, because in this campaign, I, I went and visited uh, many cities and towns all across America to make sure we took our message to hospitals uh, and also into the public square. But we also issued a letter uh, to 2.3 million healthcare practitioners uh, and healthcare professionals all across America. Uh, this is the first time in the 145 year history of our office that a directed call to action was issued to the medical profession. But the reason that we did it is because we felt that the scale of the crisis warranted it, and because I firmly believe that healthcare professionals can and must be an important part of the solution when it comes to addressing the opioid epidemic. And I want to emphasize that solution piece because I, I have been concerned that at times uh, the tendency, uh, particularly in our media coverage, but also in our public discourse, uh, the tendency is to look for who to blame. It's to say, well, who can, whose neck you know, can we hang this problem around and who can we castigate publicly? And I believe that we need to shift more from blame, uh, away from blame, rather, to thinking about who can be a part of the solution. Uh, and I really believe that clinicians uh, need to be a part of that solution. That's why we launched that campaign. But along the road, we also heard about uh, many stories. Some of those stories were very disturbing. Uh, we heard, for example, about uh, people who had lost uh, loved ones to overdoses. I sat with mothers and fathers uh, who told me that uh, they never believed uh, or could have imagined that they would have to go through the immense and tragic pain of have to, having to bury their own child. Uh, that's a degree of pain that no parent should ever have to experience. Uh, but we know uh, that 
parents all across America have been dealing with this when it come, as a result of overdose deaths from opioids. But I also heard stories of hope. I met two young men in Phoenix, Arizona, who found themselves in prison after a long and assorted experience with opioid addiction that led them to crime and that eventually led to incarceration. And there, in prison, at the lowest point in their lives, they met each other and formed a pact. And they said, if we ever survive uh, this time in prison, then we're going to commit ourselves to not only getting better, but helping other people get better too. And the place where I met them was actually at a treatment facility where they were now counselors, helping others with opioid addiction to get back on their feet, to emerge from that long tunnel of addiction and into the bright light of recovery. I heard other stories that were inspiring as well of parents who had not only lost loved ones, but who had turned their pain into a passion for helping others, who had set up organizations to help shift how we think about and talk about addiction so that people no longer have to suffer in the shadows. And ultimately, if we want to address the opioid crisis in America, I believe that there are five key things that we have to do. I believe we have to sharpen our prescribing practices so that we are providing clinicians with the true tools and training to treat pain safely and effectively. Second, I believe we have to get naloxone in the hands of first responders, recognizing that that powerful antidote to reverse opioid can save lives, especially in the setting of an overdose. And I've actually seen uh, and met many people uh, in the law enforcement community who have benefited from having naloxone at the right time. I had the privilege of visiting the Seattle Police Department a few months ago, where I rode uh, actually around the, the city with the bicycle unit, uh, a small unit of police officers who had, when I visited, recently engaged uh, in a pilot program where they were carrying naloxone uh, with them on their bikes. And the day before I visited, they had actually saved their 10th life, uh, an individual who had overdosed uh, from prescription opioids, but who was saved because they happened to be carrying naloxone. So that's the, the second thing that we have to do. The third thing we have to do is to expand access to treatment, because right now, we have over a million people who have an opioid use disorder in America who aren't getting treatment, and that's a gap that we have to close. The fourth is we have to educate the public about opioids. Now you might think, hey, this has been in the news, how could anybody not know about the opioid crisis in America? But I'm here to tell you that having talked to communities across America, there are still a lot of people who don't recognize that opioids are in fact addictive. What many people tell me is they say, it doesn't make sense to me that a prescription written by a nurse or a doctor would actually lead to harm. How could that be? But as all of us know, every medicine has benefits and risks. And when it comes to opioids, the risks are still not clear enough to the general population. And fifth and finally, I believe that we also have to make a major cultural shift in how we think about addiction. You know, there are technical solutions that are important uh, in addressing this crisis, but without this cultural solution as well, without helping people recognize that addiction is not a moral failing or a cultural or a character flaw, but that it's a chronic disease, without that shift, it's gonna be hard for people to feel comfortable coming forward and seeking help. It's gonna continue to be hard for communities to accept treatment centers in their backyards as many are hesitant to do right now. And this cultural shift is actually the subject of a larger report on addiction uh, that our office released just two weeks ago. This was the nation's first ever Surgeon General's report on alcohol and drugs. And when I share that, people often say, well, this isn't a new problem. Why has it taken so long for us to have an official Surgeon General's report on this? And what I can tell you is that it's certainly long overdue uh, for us to make that shift from recognizing that addiction is an issue that needs to be dealt with not as a criminal justice problem, but as a public health problem and approach with public health solutions. So this, is, uh, this culture shift is very important. And in, in the report, we, we drew attention to a few things, uh, a couple things I'd like to share with you today. One was the scope of the crisis that we have, not just with opioids, but with addiction overall. We still lose more people to alcohol-related uh, misuse and use disorders than to any other substance. And all told, 
There are 20.8 million people in America right now who have a substance use disorder. What surprises people is when they learn that that's actually similar to the number of people who have diabetes in America. That's one and a half times the number of people who have all cancers combined. Yet only one in 10 people with a substance use disorder is actually getting treatment. And I want you to imagine for a moment if only one in 10 people with cancer in America were getting treatment, if only one in 10 people with diabetes were getting treatment, there would be an outcry, rightly so. But we've allowed that kind of discrepancy, that gap in treatment to persist when it comes to substance use disorders. And it's time for us to change that. And the reason in part that it's time for us to change it is we actually have evidence-based treatment and prevention strategies that work. A lot of people don't realize this in the public, which is one of the other reasons we issued this report. But some of these treatment programs, the treat when you look at treatment overall, for every $1 invested in treatment, we save $4 in healthcare costs and $7 in criminal justice system costs. The returns on prevention are even bigger. In our report, we detailed specific prevention programs that have been implemented in schools and in communities. And some of them return up to $64 for every $1 invested. These are powerful programs that don't just tackle one form of addiction, but single programs can have multifactorial impacts, reducing the likelihood of alcohol misuse, tobacco addic and nicotine addiction, as well as uh, the addiction to other legal and illicit substances. But again, the cultural shift is the hardest one to make. And it's one that we can't legislate. You can't mandate that people think differently uh, about substance use disorders. But what we can do is we can lead by example. We can help people see that in our capacities, that we are creating spaces to talk uh, about addiction, that we are recognizing through the language we use and the attitude that we express, uh, that this is not an illness to be ashamed of, but it's an illness that we need to approach with the same care and compassion and urgency that we would any other chronic illness. You know, I, I wanna recognize that in the battle against addiction, the many of our sister services here have been just extraordinary leaders. Uh, the VA has an, a wonderful program that they have been working on to address uh, opioid addiction, which has succeeded in reducing uh, prescriptions for opioids by 20% since 2012. I know that the Army, that the Air Force, uh, have also been very important partners in broadening how we think about treating pain and in ensuring that we have alternatives, whether those include acupuncture, massage, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, or other services. Now, we still need to do more to invest in alternatives to treating pain, alternatives uh, to opioids. And that's why I'm also glad that uh, the NIH has actually directed even more of its funds uh, to funding uh, the research on effective alternatives uh, for the treatment of pain. But we also have to do a better job of ensuring that people know what's already available, of working with payers uh, in the private sector, but also payers within the public sector to ensure that those alternatives are covered and covered adequately. You know, there's one last thing that I'd like to touch on today, which is a deeper question that has uh, bothered me as I have spoken to people in our country about our crisis with addiction. And that's a question as to where pain comes from in the first place. When I talk to individuals who are living with a substance use disorder, what often becomes clear is that their addiction often began as part of an effort to treat some source of pain. Sometimes that was physical pain, and it was a medication like hydrocodone or oxycodone that was used. But many times the source of the pain is not physical alone. Many times it is a deeper psychological pain that people experience, often as a result of trauma. We all see this very clearly uh, in our uniformed services uh, far too often. But the question is, how do we address that deeper source of pain? And to address that, I believe that we have to broaden our thinking of well-being in our country we have to expand our focus to include not just physical well-being, but also emotional well-being. Now, many people believe that emotional well-being just refers to mental illness, and it does not. 
Emotional well-being is a much larger spectrum, uh, which also in involves the full spectrum of going all the way from mental illness to the highest and fullest form of functioning. We know that we are not just seeking to ensure that people are free of illness. We're seeking to ensure that they are functioning on the optimal end of their scale. And that's what a combination of physical and emotional well-being allow us to do. And as I've talked about this uh, you know, around our country, I've realized that most people assume that emotional well-being is something that happens to you. If you happen to have the right job, be in the right relationship, have the right amount of income, then you can be happy, you can be fulfilled, you can be emotionally well. But science actually tells us differently. A growing body of science tells us that, they are, that emotional well-being can in fact be proactively cultivated. It can be cultivated through a variety of practices, everything from exercise and sleep to contemplative practices like meditation and gratitude exercises to social connection as well. And when I was a clinician up in Boston, I saw firsthand the power of social connection. I saw, for example, that the most common illness, in fact, that affected my patients was not diabetes or hypertension, it was isolation. And science also tells us that people who are isolated, who are socially disconnected, have a higher uh, rate of early death, that their rate of cognitive decline is greater and begins earlier, that their risk of cardiovascular disease is higher, and a host of other factors. What has been promising to me is to see that there are pockets around our country where people have recognized that we have to invest in emotional well-being and where they've started on it. I have visited programs uh, in different parts of our country that have been focused on youth in particular. One in Chicago, uh, which targeted at-risk young men. And in one year, through fostering stronger social connection and helping young people develop healthy mechanisms of coping with stress, they were able to reduce violent arrest by 44% in a randomized control trial. I visited a school in California that was riddled with violence, where suspensions were high and grades were low. And they, out of desperation, instituted an emotional well-being program that was centered around meditation. In one year, they were able to reduce suspensions by 45%. In two years, by 78%, the health, health indicators for the students improved in terms of sleep, anxiety, and stress. The grades of the students improved. And overall, the students felt happier, as indicated on a survey that the state of California does every year. So this is a a powerful area, a powerful pillar of health, emotional well-being, that for far too long we haven't understood or taken advantage of. But I believe that this has to now be a new pillar that we establish for health and for prevention, right alongside with good nutrition and physical activity. And that's why our office is working on a new initiative to make emotional well-being part of the cornerstone of prevention and public health, and an investment that we make as a country We've been proud actually to be working with uh, the VA uh, on this initiative, and we hope that it's one that we can work with all of our sister services on, uh, because focusing on a combination of physical and emotional well-being are what will allow us to create healthy, strong, and resilient populations in our country. You know, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts with you today. You know, I recognize that the crisis we have with addiction in America is not a simple one that's gonna go away overnight. I realize it's complex, that it's hard, that it's gonna take a lot of people working together across sectors. And I also recognize that it has caused great pain and fear to many people in our country. But what I do know is that during times of distress, the people in America look to their trusted institutions and to trusted leaders. And this is a time where those trusted institutions are becoming far and few. But our uniformed services still retain the great trust and faith of the majority of the American people. And that's why I believe it's especially important now that we step up to address substance use disorders decisively 
not only so that we can care for the men and women in our services who have dedicated their lives uh, to our nation, but also so that we can serve as models for the rest of the country and so that we can help good lessons and effective practices spread to communities all across America. So thank you again for all the work that you have done uh, in your own services to address uh, substance use in America and to advance uh, the health of our service members and our nation. Uh, it's been a real privilege to be with you today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Admiral Murphy. Um, I was certainly impressed with the focus and, and, and vision you have for this increasingly difficult problem. And for those of you who shared uh, the concerns that it, it rose in me, um, one of our continuing education tracks is exactly on this topic. And the subject matter experts from Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Veterans Administration have been working on alternative treatments uh, to avoid opioid addiction in the first place, and then treatments to solve opioid addictions after they occur are, are going on. So if you'd like to get more information, it's right upstairs. I recommend it highly to you. May we prevail on the two of you since we have some time to answer a few questions? I know your schedules are tight. If, they, if you must go, oh, okay. But uh, I, would love, I would love to give the audience a chance to, to ask if it, would that be all right? Uh, sure, if, may I make one suggestion? Yes, um, certainly. If, I just need to step out for five minutes, but I can come right back. If Jen wants to start with the first question, <laughs> then uh, I'll be right back. I just need to make okay, a phone good. call. All right, all thank right. you. All right, Do Dr. Murthy will return in a moment. Uh, for any questions for Dr. Lee? Good Dr. morning. Dr. Kellerman. Art Kellerman, Dean of America's Medical School at the Uniformed Services University. Uh, I would have said to Surgeon General Murthy, but I know you'll pass on later, that one of the individuals that will be in that pain curriculum today is Trip Buckenmeyer, who directs our Defense Veterans Center for Integrated Pain Management. And what that team has done, VA and DOD together, has not only tackled this problem, but developed a comprehensive curriculum, a joint pain education project to help clinicians know non-pharmacologic opportunities to manage acute and chronic pain. My question for Dr. Lee, though, goes back to your comment about that intriguing intermediate care technician program. You and I are both ER docs, and we're very familiar with how EMS in the, in the United States is delivered almost entirely by non-licensed EMTs and paramedics practicing under the license of an EMS medical director. We're contemplating, have not yet decided, but contemplating a pilot program in DOD to work with Navy corpsmen, Army medics, Air Force med techs to do urgent care, episodic care, primary care under the online supervision of licensed DOD primary care providers. If that pilot's successful, and if we're able to show that medics, corpsmen, and med techs can perform as well in the U.S. as they do downrange in a wider range of clinical scenarios, might the VA and states like Virginia be interested in looking at a role like that, given the caliber of these individuals when they transition to the civilian world and the challenge they face today finding employment? Absolutely. Well, that's a softball, Dr. Kellerman. <laughs> I think, uh, I think the answer uh, is really clear and that uh, we will be able to, to prove to um, all of our civilian health systems that the medics and corpsmen can do exactly, can, can perform um, extremely well doing the same uh, types of uh, skills and um, uh, providing the same service that they do while active duty because you know, one of the things that uh, we had to educate uh, a lot of our providers uh, on is that there's, there's a, the uh, understanding that they're working downrange in the battlefield, on ships, et cetera, but actually they're also at military treatment facilities here. Um, I, as an ER doc at working at Walter Reed, uh, and before it was Walter Reed, Bethesda Naval Medical Center worked alongside Corman, 
um, and then worked with Corman and medics uh, in the ER. And in the, in the beginning, I, I was not familiar with the roles of Fenix and Corman, and uh, as we saw patients together, uh, really impressed by everything that they could do. And I think there's just a matter of educating um, the rest of us in the, health, in the healthcare system about their great skills. It's, it's a no-brainer. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Mike Fairbaction, Violate Professional IT Services. Um, hearing some of these disparate facts, I'm trying to connect the dots. So for example, finding out that civilian suicide rate has gone up uh, is obviously very uh, alarming in addition to uh, the veteran suicide rate. Um, knowing that people are using apps and minute clinics more than going to the doctor might be reflective of the fact that uh, they may have insurance, but they may not have the time to go see a doctor or to get away from, you know, being uh, from, from work. And so in light of some demographic shifts that we see, you know, obviously for medical practitioners or IT folks um, or, or people who paid off their student loan debts, it's a lot better than if you're in the manufacturing or the coal industry or millennial with a lot of student loan debt. Has there been any attempt to correlate some of these risk factors with suicide, um, opioid or other substance addictions with general economic uh, trends and concerns and then report that back either to Congress or Department of Commerce and say, here is the human and financial cost of effects in demographic shifts, in, in, uh, in uh, policy or whatever, because at the end of the day, the VA is sitting on a tremendous amount of longitudinal data from people who reflect all walks of life. They could be rural, from a working class background, they can be from an urban area, they can be this age group, that age group, so it's really the best ability to find those hidden insights. Has there been any attempt to do that massive big data analytics and say, here is the cost to society as a whole, not just individual deaths and addictions? Sure. It's a really interesting question, and I think that's the opportunity we have now uh, especially with our uh, a suicide report that we just put out in, uh, in August. We put out sort of the first uh, chapter, if you will, of the report, but these over 50 million records that uh, we've um, uh, studied and analyzed now uh, are that we've matched with the National Death Index to discover who was a veteran um, and, and, and find to look for patterns. I think we're gonna learn a tremendous amount from this analysis and we're just getting into it. We're just getting into the, uh, scratching the surface of this data. Uh, and, and then learning also, as, as we're doing with our ReachVet program, our predictive analytics program, what can we find, what kinds of um, patterns or um, indicators can we find in our own electronic health record? Um, so I think there's tremendous opportunity, and we think too that some of the things that we find will be applicable uh, absolutely to the general population in this problem of suicide. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for an outstanding presentation. I'm Sylvia Trent Adams. I'm the Deputy Surgeon General for the Public Health Service. Um, one question. You mentioned in the ICT um, model that there was a career ladder. Could you talk a, a little bit about what that career ladder program would look like and how that plays into team-based care? Sure, sure. So what we found um, in launching this program is that medics and Corman had um, you couldn't pin them into one particular track. They didn't all want to be nurses. Uh, they wanted to become, to go to medical school, to become PAs, to become CRNAs or psychologists or uh, what have you. There was a whole range of interests, just like there's a whole range and diversity of experience of our medics and corpsmen. And so uh, at VA, uh, a lot of what we're doing, in, we're still building out multiple career ladders and we want to do that. Um, I think one of the, the places we've had success, um, and I was talking with Admiral Faison about this earlier, uh, is uh, in, in linking our, uh, our program with, PA, with partners, in particular certain schools, uh, uh, PA schools and nursing schools, where they can get a jump start on uh, getting the uh, recognized credential or degree that they'll need you know, to, to go on and practice. But uh, I think these types of programs, so with why they're so valuable is, is, first of all, it gives them a job now. It's a career now. They can support themselves and their families. They can keep their skills up, which is also important as you continue on in, in healthcare. Um, and we get to benefit at VA, and I think everybody can actually benefit, which is why we made it a priority in Virginia. Uh, and we're able to get um, broad-based, bipartisan support you know, to launch the program quickly. Uh, and um, uh, this earlier this year. 
So I think there's tremendous, tremendous opportunity there if we um, uh, plan out multiple pathways and also do the educational piece. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ben Kligler from the Office of Patient-Centered Care at the VA. And I want to thank you, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. And uh, I more just want to reflect quickly on uh, a comment that the Surgeon General made about um, prevention, uh, that we think about the opioid addiction problem, the opioid overuse problem, and we think about it still often from a disease model. And I would offer that in some respects with suicide, we do the same thing. And how do we push ourselves to move further and further upstream, perhaps, or downstream, I'm not sure which way, but to the place before it becomes a problem? And, and I would propose, and, and I appreciated the reference to uh, Dr. Buckemeyer and the, the work that DV Sippum is doing around pain, that we need a closer collaboration between VA and DOD from a prevention point of view. So how do we reach people from the armed forces before they leave with a skill set and an orientation towards emotional well-being and self-care and all the things they need for suicide prevention way before they come to the place where we need an emergency intervention or for the pain problem and opioid addiction way before they need the opioid prescription. And I know I'm relatively new to the VA and I know that many efforts have been made around this, but I think it's kind of a plea for a closer, a, a more conversation and a, a closer collaboration so that we can really move further down in the, into where we can prevent some of these from becoming medical issues because they really are about emotional well-being and the resources that, that our, our soldiers and sailors are bringing to the table. So mm -hmm. could, uh, could more you, comment, yeah. yeah. So, since Dr. Murthy's returned, could you condense that down for his benefit? Give sure. Us a, give us a cliff note version because sure. I think he probably would want to respond to that very good question. Sure, very quickly. I'm Ben Kligler from Office of Patient-Centered Care, so I work with Dr. Godet, so we're, and we're very excited about the event in January. Um, what I was saying was just that we need a more prevention-oriented approach and that DOD and VA need to work more seamlessly together around equipping the members of our armed forces with the skills around self-care, reflection, understanding, emotional well-being so that we prevent these things from becoming medical problems. And I know that's something we all want to do, but executing it is a challenge. So I just wanted to put that on the table as a, a sort of, I know from the VA side, we really want to do that and, and how we can make that happen. We all need to work together, but so. I'll, I'll start, well, first of all, thank you, Ben. Um, I, Ben's, uh, Ben's office, the Office of Patient-Centered Care and VA does fantastic work. Um, in uh, helping promote and uh, disseminate a lot of the uh, complementary and alternative uh, treatment modalities that uh, General Murthy mentioned earlier, too. And uh, it's, um, it, I, I totally agree. Um, as we think about how to approach the problem of suicide, we have to move more upstream. And it's not, it, we can't just build out the crisis line. I and mean, we have to do that in order to be there for uh, veterans who are in crisis. But we wanna prevent them from getting to that point of crisis. And I think it comes back to actually a lot of, Vivek, what you said too, about chronic pain and emotional well-being and how do we uh, equip uh, transitioning service members and veterans with those tools? How do we address pain? Because pain is a risk factor for suicide. Uh, along with a number of other, uh, other risk factors we know about. So that's definitely one of the things we're doing. When it, it's one of the reasons why uh, earlier this year um, we decided to, to expand and elevate our Office of Suicide Prevention at the VA so that uh, they could interface with more than just uh, mental health um, uh, providers, um, that they could work more seamlessly with our DOD, uh, with our Veterans Benefits Administration, um, and to continue the work with the private partners that they're doing. Yeah, you know, I would also agree, and I just want to, I agree with everything uh, Dr. Lee said. I think that one of the key things that we have to do if we want to make emotional well-being part of our practice and our mindset uh, is that we have to put it on the map for people as an issue that matters. And right now, for far too many people, including people who have spent their lives in healthcare, <coughs> It's not always clear to them that emotional well-being needs to be part of our strategy for creating a healthy population. We still have, as I think of it, a suck it up mentality, you know, in our in our country, which is that if you're in pain or if you have an emotional distress, then you just got to suck it up. You got to find some way to deal with it. 
we see it as, an, as evidence of weakness without recognizing that we have people in our country who are under a growing amount of stress and who don't have the tools to handle and deal, deal with that stress properly. And this, is, this includes kids as well. You know, when I think about the pipeline, you know, of young people, young talented people that we want to come into our uniform services, uh, you know, I think about how chronic illnesses, you know, are making it harder and harder for us to find folks, whether it's obesity or other illnesses. But I also think about stress and emotional well-being as being important factors. Because when I travel to colleges, I, 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 have, I have two questions that I ask at every university uh, that I go to. The first question is, how many of you in the last month feel that you have experienced an unbearable amount of stress? And without exception, 95% of the hands usually go up. And then I ask the second question, which is how many of you feel that you have tools to deal with that stress in a healthy way? And without exception, less than 5% of the hands go up. And I feel that that actually reflects where our larger population is. And if we, I believe that if we do this right, that our uniform services can actually be models for how we should think about health and approach health, models that can serve the rest of the healthcare system and the rest of the country. Uh, but that will require putting emotional well-being on the map for uh, folks in our, in our orbit, uh, including people who have spent their lives in health. And that's not easy. Uh, it requires thoughtful, reasoned arguments that are backed by science, which is one of the reasons that we are working with the VA to launch this larger national initiative around emotional well-being. Take one more question. If, if not, could we have another round of applause for our speakers this morning? As, as they depart the stage, we're getting ready to, to take a break in, in just a minute, but we want to s talk a little bit about AMSIS membership. Uh, I mentioned very briefly at the opening that AMSIS is an organization that was uh, created for the advancement of federal health care. It was created initially for the advancement of military medicine, but certainly we've grown far beyond that to include the VA and the United States Public Health Service as, as well as, uh, as other organizations. We do that in two ways. We have this meeting and we publish the journal Military Medicine. And in those venues, we try to do this, about three things. Advance continuing education, make leadership connections, uh, provide opportunities where uh, young lieutenants can shake the hand of their surgeons general, uh, where they can hear from their leaders what they're thinking and where they're going and where agencies can talk to each other. Uh, we just heard two major agencies tell us what they think is important and where they're going in the future. I think that, and I have always been in AMSIS my whole career because I think it's critical for medical readiness. Medical readiness meaning that, that's, that general sense and knowledge about the things that one needs to do and the relationships between organizations and people that have to exist for us to be successful. And this came home to me in a very personal way in 1992. All of a sudden I found myself the Joint Task Force Surgeon for Operation Restore Hope. If you remember, there were a thousand people a day in Somalia dying in a civil war and, and a drought. Um, so the, the, the human toll was awful. A coalition of 25 different nations, 52,000 people poured into this country that had no infrastructure, no resources, and at the time was the most disease-ridden place in the world. And I was responsible for the health care of, of these 52,000 people, and I was scared to death. Well, we, as we were setting up, I was supposed to have 100 beds ready to go by the Swedish Field Hospital. And I walked over to the Swedish Field Hospital and found that half the tents were just lying in, on the sand. They were, they were just laying there. As I proceeded to pitch an epic fit, which was probably going to turn into an international incident if left unchecked, the commander of the Swedish hospital walked up to me from behind and said, oh, hi, Mike, what's up? 
Well, it was a, it was a colleague that I'd met and had beers with at Amsis, and who, who I knew and, and had some trust for. I, I turned around and I deflated and came off my high horse. Uh, and he walked over and he said, look, I've got them for you. These are inflatable tents. And, and he says, I just take this little plug and I plug it in this little thing right here and the tent blows up. And I have your 100 tents in about five minutes. Is it okay if I leave them laying here for right now? Well, of course it was. Um, so AMSIS is one of those things that affects us all in intangible and unpredictable ways. So I'd like to ask a couple questions. One, we're about to break, so stick with me. Is there anybody here whose, whose needs at this meeting are not being met? And that's, that's education and fellowship. And frankly, as I said at the opening thing, having a good time. Give me a hand if we're not meeting your needs. That's, that's great news, and thank you so much. Uh, that, that makes me feel good, and I will pass that on to the staff. Uh, now, who's, raise your hand if you're a member of AMSIS. Okay? That's, that's a pretty good representation. I would, I would ask those of you who are not members to seriously consider becoming so. AMSIS doesn't get a government subsidy. We, we keep our doors open and our lights on by registration fees, which we keep as low as we can uh, through, uh, through uh, sponsorships and, and other means. Uh, there's a cost to publishing the journal. Uh, there's a cost to putting these things on. And we depend on members to help us defray those costs. So if you like us and you want us to keep going and doing the things that we do, please consider being a member. So if you're not a member, uh, as you leave here, I would ask you to think about going down to the registration or going online and just looking at it. And frankly, we keep our membership costs low enough. It won't even put a dent in your Starbucks budget, okay? So think about joining us. Now we're going to break. And I would, I would like to request that as many AMSIS members as, as possible, if you're an AMSIS member, stay here for a bit. We're going to have a business meeting. And it's important. This will be an important business meeting. If you are not a member and choose to leave, please do so in a military and orderly fashion so that we can get this meeting started. Um, and if you're not a member, but you th might be thinking about it, please feel welcome to stay, okay? So break time right now. Business meeting to start on the, wait, Okay, we can do that. 15 minute break time. If you're going to, oh, 15 minute meeting. This is my boss. This is Dr. General David Rubenstein. He's the chairman of the board of directors. So if, you, if you're a member and you're in the back, let's kind of mosey forward and, and come up closer. If you're going to leave, please, please do so. And as soon as the uh, movement dies down a little bit. Dr. Rubenstein will take over the mic and we'll have our business meeting. It will only take 15 minutes. And, and for, all, uh, for all of you, the, uh, the um, exhibit hall opens at 10 a.m. Uh, and the exhibitors are still there and still eager to speak and show you their wares. <laughs>